All right, our second and final speaker of the afternoon uh, session is Ursula Witcher from MapReview. She will tell us about Adinka Rainbows and generalized thermometer. Hey folks, it's so good to be here. Thanks for organizing and thanks everyone for coming. I want to talk to you today about some work that I'm working on with Amanda Francis, who is also at Math Reviews with me. We kind of split up algebra and geometry between us. So you can see there's lots of different kinds of algebra geometry combinatorics flying into this. And this is a work in progress. What I'm really hoping to do is just sell you on these objects as cool things to play around with so that I can get more people in the community playing around with things called adinkras. Uh, the motivation is from physics and we're going to go physics to algebras to combinatorics and push all the way down to arithmetic geometry and then ask whether there's anything that we can lift back up any up the column again in any way. Okay. Adinkras were formalized as physics -y mathematical objects by Michael Fox and Jim Gates. And they take their name from an uh, older symbol that are symbols used in artwork from Ghana. These are symbols that can very compactly convey like a large amount of information, a big idea. And so Gates and Fox said, this is exactly what we're doing. We're somehow like cramming all of this information into a pretty graphical object. So we should call them a Dinkers kind of in honor of this older art form. All right, so let's do a little bit of physics. In the standard model of particle physics, we got a bunch of bosons, things like photons, which convey light particles, gluons, which convey other kinds of forces. Um, the Higgs boson, I, um, I'm very proud that I have a non-binary uh, artist here illustrating my Higgs boson. Um, uh, and then we've also got a bunch of fermions, um, which might be things like electrons that you remember back in the day in chemistry class actually going into being components of matter. Right. Uh, supersymmetry is a symmetry in the sense of physical theories that should exchange bosons and fermions. In particular, every time you have a boson, you should have a fermion partner and vice versa. This is not something that has been experimentally been observed. There's lots of fermions out there where if they have a boson, firm, uh, a boson partner, it's like incredibly hard to find. We've been smashing atoms together in the super collider, just have not located it. Um, but on the other hand, nice symmetries, we're mathematicians, we don't have to care if the physicists have found them, we can just enjoy the symmetry for its own sake. So that's what we're going to do. Okay. Let's mathematicalize this a little bit, we're going to think of both our bosons and our fermions as depending on some, uh, as being functions that depend on some kind of parameter t. And then we'll have operators, um, each supersymmetry operator can turn bosons into fermions or fermions into bosons. We're going to use the anti commutator, which is just AB plus BA. This is clearly not a commutative geometry kind of thing necessarily. Um, and then a one dimensional supersymmetry algebra is going to have an anti commutator that's just two times the square root of negative one, um, a Dirac delta times the derivative with respect to T. So we're doing one dimensional supersymmetry here. We, that means we have one time dimension and nothing else. Usually you would think that if you're stuck in zero dimension spatially, nothing happens, but because this is quantum physics, weird stuff can still go on. And we're still gonna see that we have all kinds of structure to play with here. Okay. So let's try to combinatorialize this. We're gonna make a thing called a chromotypology, chromo for color. It's a finite simple graph. We're gonna make a bipartite graph. In other words, we'll have half our vertices be bosons and half our other half be fermions. Uh, we're going to assume that it is N regular. So every single boson or fermion is going to have N different edges coming out of it. And they're going to be colored one of our N possible colors. We think of those colors as corresponding to the operator. So you think of moving along one of these edges as transforming boson to fermion or fermion to boson. And then finally, we require that every uh, square or you know, quasi square in this diagram, um, that we can have squares made by just taking a pair of colors. Um, so this is a pretty complicated diagram, but you can see, for instance, if you want green, blue, and then green and blue again, you'd be back where you started. 
And this graph has that property for any pair of colors starting in any place. So that last property is what is going to correspond to one piece of our anti-commutator condition. To build a full adinkra, I also need to throw in an odd dashing. Um, essentially, if I do the same operator, you know, if I go green, blue, green, blue again, and get back where I started, that picks me up a negative sign somewhere in here. The odd dashings tell me where to put the negative signs. They are not going to matter for the rest of this talk. Uh, what is going to matter for the rest of this talk is a height assignment. Um, now, I've drawn this graph here already with a height assignment in the sense that I have uh, some open vertices on one level, and then the next level all has closed vertices, and then the next level has open vertices again. Um, and we're going to assume that for any adinkra, we can actually do that, that there's some consistent way to define the heights so that at each level, we only have fermions or we only, we only have bosons. And if you go from one level to another, you're following a single edge. Right. There's a classification theorem for chromotopologies, which is that every single one is going to be some kind of appropriate quotient of a hypercube. So um, what I have drawn here on my slide, this is, uh, um, I think, n equals four hypercube um, in the sense of a chromotopology. And I could get anything else with this number of colors by taking appropriate quotients of it. I want to talk more about height functions. First of all, you can imagine sort of traveling around height functions by just grabbing a vertex and moving it up to the next possible level. So you take your fermion and you move it up to the next fermion level, or maybe you take your boson and you move it down to the next possible boson level, something like that. There are a ton of these things. Uh, so here's a table that was worked out um, by YX Zhang. Um, you can see that already in dimension five, we have 395 some thousand of these things. On the other hand, this is not a very sophisticated classification of height function. Um, this table here would say, for instance, if I relabel my bosons or if I switch bosons and fermions, it would give me a distinct height function because I technically put a vertex in a different place. I, we want to geometrize. So we're going to take our chromatopology and we're going to throw in our rainbow. Got to use the rainbows. Um, a rainbow for us is going to be a cyclic rainbow. You go around the rainbow, you end up back at the beginning of the rainbow. Um, if we've got that information, we're going to be able to build an algebraic curve. And it's also going to come with a belly map, which means that we're going to have a map to P1 that's ramified at three points. Right, so let me draw a picture for you. Let's take the n equals three cube. We're going to take our bisexual rainbow. That means we're doing magenta and violet and blue. And I'm going to start, um, what I've got so far is just like um, something that's a graph. I want to imagine gluing in some squares to my graph. So I'm going to glue in the magenta violet squares. I'm going to glue in the violet blue squares. Then I'm going to loop around because we've got circular rainbows and glue in the blue magenta squares. And you can imagine that I'd get a curve. Here, you're supposed to be imagining that the curve is a sphere. It's what we've got if we've just sort of spatialized and filled in all of the possible facets here on this sphere-like object. Now, if I wanted, I could have a sort of quotient map where I um, take all of my magenta edges and I glue them together. I take all of my blue edges and glue them together. I take all of my violet edges and glue them together. I would then get a new space, which has only three colors of edges. It had a special point coming from all the fermions, and it had a special point coming from all of the bosons. That is what we creatively call the beach ball. And then you can map your beach ball down to the Riemann sphere um, by then identifying all of the edges together um, and sending your two points to say zero and infinity. So that's sort of if we get a value map, we also get a little extra structure because we always factor through the beach ball. Now, there is a well-defined map that starts with a height function 
and it gives you a divisor on this algebraic curve built in the manner I have just illustrated for you. Um, but that algebraic curve, it might be really high genus. In fact, it probably is really high genus. So we want to simplify a little bit so we can push further to the Jacobian of this curve. You could try to do examples. For the n equals one hypercube, the n equals two hypercube, we saw that the n equals three hypercube just gives us a sphere. So that tells us that, okay, we've got a genus zero curve and there isn't any information in the Jacobian. So although we could define uh, corresponding points from height functions, they wouldn't really tell us a lot. For n equals four, we get a non-trivial Jacobian, we get an elliptic curve, but unfortunately all the height functions still map divisors to like the identity of the elliptic curve. So we still don't have any exciting information. Okay. Now, this was worked out by Duran, Iga, um, Kostiak, and Stefan Mendez Diaz, that for the n equals five hypercube, if you do this map to divisors, you get one thing that is non-trivial at least. Um, so that's where Amanda and I came in in this process. We said, okay, there's 395,000 some height functions. We know that there is at least one non-trivial thing. Is there more than one non-trivial thing? We didn't know when we started looking at this. Yeah, 395,000. Um, so first of all, you ask, okay, well, we map height functions to divisors. What kind of image can we have? What kind of points can we get on this Jacobian? And then you hope that maybe you can do more. Um, maybe you can uh, classify height functions in some sense using information that you gather by simplifying down to the divisor map, which we know simplifies a lot because in the lower dimensions, it just basically throws everything away and um, identifies all of the height functions. And then you could hope that maybe you could even then start pulling that information back and see what it did on the algebra level instead of the graph theory level. So how are we going to do this? We want to get more explicit about what our actual points are on curves and things like that. So we use a specific realization. Um, we're going to realize our Adinkra curve as a complete intersection in P4. It depends on a couple of parameters. It's an intersection of quadrics. Um, you can think of the parameters as depending on a fifth root of negative one. But maybe in this case, it's more fun to think of them as being related to the golden ratio. So one of our parameters is exactly the golden ratio, and then we've got one plus the golden ratio, and we're using those in our intersection of quadrics. Yes. Um, I am very well interested in how we're going to the Dinkler curve. So are we literally thinking about it as a graph on the curve, and this is like the intersection of lines on a curve defining the Dinkler curve, or are we defining the curve associated to the Dinkler in a different way? Right, so what we have is we have a sort of abstract Riemann surface, um, and then there is a map which would embed our abstract Riemann surface, which has our graph embedded into it, into this complete intersection. Okay, so it's a Riemann surface with the Adinkra embedded on it. Yeah. Yes. Yes. All right. So things are really special here, right? We built this beautiful intersection of quadrics. We use the golden ratio in the parameters in our quadrics. It turns out that the Jacobian that we get is also a really special Jacobian. It's a product of five isogenous elliptic curves. Um, and they all have J invariant 2048. So we can get to 2048. <laughs> and we can talk about where individual pieces of the Adinkra go under this map. So if we want to know what is the subgroup that's generated by important points on the Adinkra, that is, that's generated by the images of fermion points, it's generated by the images of boson points. And it turns out that when defining divisors corresponding to height functions, we also care about the centers of faces. 
So that's our third kind of point is centers of faces. We get a subgroup on each elliptic curve. And in each case, that subgroup is generated by one thing of infinite order. You can pick your favorite fermion or boson to do it. One face center of order four. There's always a special face center that has order four. It's a different pair of colors for each of our five curves. And then we can pick another face center that's of order two that doesn't happen to be twice the one of order four we already picked. And that gives us a nice group. Now, if you care about elliptic curves, you probably care where these things are defined. Um, so in, for three of our elliptic curves, the points are defined over Q adjoined that fifth root of negative one and then I. In a couple of cases, uh, things don't work out quite as prettily, and we also need to throw in a square root of the golden ratio in order to define the centers of our, to, to show where our face centers go. Um, now, in the nice case, the group of rational points is exactly isomorphic on this curve to z plus z mod 4 plus z mod 2. So for three of our curves, we're really sort of getting everything just by mapping in our face centers and picking our favorite fermion or boson point. And the other two curves, well, we threw in an extra square root of five, we get some more points on the elliptic curve, but we can kind of ignore them and what we're doing because we don't see them. Here's an example of what kinds of things could happen. You might start with the extended hypercube. So all the way pulled out the way I showed you in the pictures earlier, where you have one vertex at the top, one vertex at the bottom, the other ones in between. And we might take the lowest vertex and we might raise it up to the next place that we can put it. And then say, OK, where does that go in each of these groups of this elliptic curve? Um, so here are a couple of examples. There are 32 possible height functions that do this because you could pick anything to be your top vertex and then the opposite is the bottom vertex. Um, and here's the kind of images that you get. So in this particular case, you can see that there's some variation. We didn't know at first whether it would even matter like which elliptic curve you matter to, right? Because they are all isogenous. But we do see variation from curve to curve. Some things are slightly different. In this case, not very different where it's essentially a question of, oh, what does the generator that I'm mapping to of, say, my infinite group match up with the generator that I picked when I coded this stuff? So for this particular type of type function, you really do get like a fingerprint. You can see, all right, all of these are the same up to choices of generators and some reordering, reshuffling of our groups. But there are slightly weirder things that can happen, even if you took height functions that you think are morally the same. In other words, that you thought were the same up to relabeling your vertices in some way. Um, that's partly because there are two possible signs for images of vertices. So depending on exactly which vertex you're working with, you might throw in a plus or a minus sign somewhere. And there's also kind of a fun relation between fermion vertice, vertices and, and boson vertices. So even if you pick ones that are consistent in sign, if you add them together, you're going to get something that's two times the generator of order four. Um, so if you're messing around and relabeling vertices, it could be that you get slightly different looking height functions. The ways that we would expect them to differ are by these sign changes and by um, appearances or disappearances of twice a generator of order four. But I should say that we have not yet explored all 395,000 sum height functions. Um, we've only done approximately 1,000, I think. So there's still possibly room for weirder stuff to happen as well. Stay tuned. Right. Um, just to show you um, where things go. Um, so we've been working, oh, sorry, let's go back again. Um, we've been working through uh, by the number of sinks. So fully extended, you have a single sink. If you raise one vertex, all of a sudden you have two sinks. Um, and you can keep on going like that all the way down to if you want 16 sinks, that means you've made what we call the Valisa Dinkra, where you just squished everything and it's flat. So half your vertices are on the bottom. So lots of stuff to explore. 
Lots of questions about how to organize these more complicated height functions. We're really hoping that algebra will be helpful here in, because once you get to like multiple kinds of different things in different places, it's hard to like encapsulate what you're even talking about. And then of course we can hope to start pulling back up the ladder and asking, can we maybe see the shadow of some uh, supersymmetry algebra here down at the bottom where we've been mucking around in points on elliptic curves and arithmetic, ge arithmetic geometry. So let me end there.